There's a text out there that is known in the theatre world for being one of the most gruesome, grisly pieces of script ever put to page. Its script is littered with lines that would make an actor's face drop in horror, and feature stage directions that frighten even the most seasoned of directors. It was first shown in 1998 to the disgust of reviewers and critics, who were undecided as to what it was they had just witnessed. I was very much sort of open to the rehearsals and, and to see what was going to happen, because when I first read it I thought, I don't know how, I don't know how we're going to do this. A university campus where the worst atrocities imaginable are shown as spectacles of sadistic joy. Scenes so brutal that some left the theatre in abject horror or in outright repulsion. That is to say, whatever you can think of that's taboo to put on a stage or screen, it's in the script of this play. This is a genre of theatre known as in-your-face theatre, which is a decidedly British set of writers in the 1990s who challenged the audience by putting the worst problems of the world before your very eyes. The play we're talking about today is titled Cleansed by Sarah Kane, which is in my opinion one of the most viscerally shocking but painfully romantic plays of the genre. I think Sarah Kane really does challenge every single element of theatre. I think she challenges designers, directors, actors, audience members. I think Sarah Kane and our production is wanting the audience to see past the violence. I think that's the biggest challenge. In the play, we have Tinker, who functions as the central character. He serves as the harbinger of pain and suffering while the remainder of the cast are subject to his torture for the majority of the play, enduring horrific and seemingly impossible actions and stage directions to perform. And Tinker does not hold back when it comes to his methods of torture. This play includes drug overdose, implied assisted suicide, body dysmorphia, mental anguish, ableism, homophobia, body horror, forced sodomy, multiple counts of bodily mutilation, incest, this is only a quarter of the way through the play, by the way. Misogyny, rape, public indecency, murder, suicide, unassisted this time, forced gender reassignment, explicit sex scenes, and sensory overloads. That is a lot. The non-stop conga line of trauma is in part through inspiration of another play similar in structure, named Wojciech by George Büchner. Cleansed is, is structurally based on Wojtzeck, Brooklyn's play, which I directed last year. Um, now, Brooklyn's Wojtzeck is an absolutely perfect gem of a play to look at for this, in that anything remotely extraneous or explanatory is completely cut, and all you get is those moments of extremely high drama. Um, and what I was trying to do with Cleansed was a similar thing, but in a different way. Um. The play lacks a sense of temporality, with many suggesting that the play's scenes can be rearranged to any order without the structure falling apart. Most of Wojciech's scenes are set during the height of the conflict of the scene, so there is little time for the audience to recover from point to point. It also didn't help that George Büchner died while writing the script, so the true ending to this play is something we will never know. Kane's structure appears to mimic this, before driving the intensity of cleansed scenes to its maximum, resulting in almost an entire play filled with the most graphic theatrical images imaginable. I think Sarah Kane was a person of the theatre, so when her plays are described as being unstageable, I think that's a slight misreading of what she's doing. What Sarah doesn't do is solve. There's no solutions in her scripts, but that doesn't mean they're not stageable. It just means that if you're going to stage them, you've got to be alert, and you've got to have your brain on. Within the script, there are many stage directions and events that are seemingly impossible to stage, literally speaking. 
and many directors and designers have had trouble attempting to realise the words Sarah Kane has put in the script. For example, a sunflower bursts through the floor and grows above their heads. Then a long stream of automatic gunfire. The rats carry Cole's feet away. But there was lots of things we failed at. Mm. We couldn't do the rats. We spent hours, endless conversation about rats. Should we have real rats? No, the Germans tried real rats. They were dreadful. They're too shy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then the first production tried socks through holes. So we tried socks through holes. No, that didn't work. It was too comedic. And then finally we came up with the rat. The homage to the stage direction is the rat shooting that happens. That was the best that we could offer up. So we failed on a lot of them. There's supposed to be a white light thing that we failed on. There's a whole catalogue. Towards the end, I remember sitting there with everyone going, ah, oh, well, how are we going to do? No. Anyone think of how we could do this? Nope. Why not? So we just crossed them out. Mm. Here we are. But we tried to do nearly everything. And we, we risk, you know, it's very risky to do sprouting flora and fauna. It's very risky to do that gracefully. It just risks, you know. Mm. These stage directions are not just to mess with the director who is putting this on the stage, although, full disclosure, it definitely feels like it. I have actually had to direct this play, and it's not shits and giggles having to portray the act of dismembering someone's feet without it looking stupid. But rather, she writes, for a writer, not a director. The incest, the violence, the sex, all have a lot of references to real-world events. The scenes with Robin, for example, are based off of something Kane herself has heard from newspapers. I put it in the play, everyone was shocked. Then in the rehearsal room, I'd say, well, actually, where this comes from is, and I'd tell them, they would go, oh! you know, and they'd read the play, and I'm like, what, do you think I make this stuff up? <laughs> I don't know, I don't know this. Jesus Christ, I mean... And there was a similar thing with Robin in Cleansed. It's Robin's based on... Um, a young black man who was on Robben Island with Nelson Mandela. Um, he was 18 years old. He was put in Robben Island and told he was going to be there for 45 years. Didn't mean anything to him. He was illiterate. Didn't mean a thing. Nelson Mandela and some of the other prisoners taught him to read and write. He learned to count, realised what 45 years was and hung himself. But why use these horrid images? These disgusting acts? These are the questions that are asked constantly from most of the reviews of Kane's works, and the answer to Kane is fairly simple. She wanted to make something that could only be shown in theatre. Yet a lot of writers do not appear to have the courage to put these ideas to paper. With that context in mind, it makes a lot more sense that she would subject her audiences to the cruelties of the world through the most visceral representations of that cruelty. Because these things happen, and they are not glamorous, heroic, nor bring about much catharsis in reality. Tinker is a representation of a world that attacks vulnerable people for almost no reason other than the fact they don't fit in. Carl and Rod are a gay couple, Robin is mentally challenged, the woman is an object for Tinker to abuse, and Grace and Graham can be read as an analogy of transgenderism, or an incestuous relationship depending on who you ask, but... I prefer the transgender reading. And yet, the most clear theme of the play for me is the theme of grief from losing the person you love the most. Carl and Rod, a young gay couple, slowly begin to lose each other physically throughout the play. Carl loses his tongue to Tinker, so he then writes his messages in the mud with his hands. Carl loses his hands to Tinker, so he dances to express himself to Rod. Carl loses his feet to Tinker, so Rod carries the burden for the both of them, where Tinker then kills Rod quickly and painlessly. There's something intensely romantic behind this mutilation and this pain. To see that their love adapts to be just as strong despite so many setbacks from a terrifying presence is beyond powerful to see. That's where I get this strange beauty within the writing, with so many characters dealing with grief by clinging on to refractions of a love they wish they had. This same portrayal of love carries through to the other stories between other characters, such as one entailing Grace, mourning the death of her brother by physically becoming him. Kane's works have often struck me as something closer to poetry that lies within the structure of a play, rather than a narrative with characters to follow. Violence, love, and Sarah Kane have always gone hand in hand, yet, even so, Kane never once states that real hands be cut off. 
the idea of hands is up to the interpretation of the director. It is a shame that most revisions of the play go for such literal interpretations that show Clens to be a poignant love story opaquely hidden behind a wall of blood. I hope people will write better plays. I mean, that's all I can hope. Uh, but I doubt they will. I mean, rubbish has always been produced through the ages. Mediocrity has always been praised. That's simply what happens. And most good plays are only really um, liked in retrospect with hindsight. I feel as if there is this dissatisfaction within Kane, seeing people try to create the most mainstream, palatable masterpiece to bring in good reviews, and self-serving pats on the back from their peers for yet another depressed cis white male talking about depression and mental illness for 60 minutes in a fringe theatre. It all feels too safe, too comfortable for the serious subject matter, yet those 60 minute monologues about mental health are the plays that audiences seemed to love at the time. The audience in Cleansed, however, physically begin to feel the discomfort and the grief the characters go through as they watch it, rather than empathising with the pain on a surface level scale emotionally. The more I dove into the text, the more the romance began to stand out, and that was where I began to focus. Those people, the critics, perhaps misunderstand the blood, the screams, and the abuse as only for shock because they cannot see within themselves that this reaction is a reaction of grief to a suffering world around them. And the worst thing to remember is that they have the privilege to leave the room, to avoid the conflicts that minorities, abuse victims, and the poor go through every day, just by shutting your eyes and ears and complaining, ironically, that such atrocities are being performed. Tinker himself may be a reference to Jack Tinker, a critic who famously tore apart Kane's play Blasted, calling it a disgusting feast of filth. And from that, suggests that Kane used Jack Tinker to become the character we see in Cleansed, as a marker of an oppressor who inflicts pain and reaction to love shown by Carl to Rod and Robin to Grace. Yet, Tinker lacks the responsibility to understand the oppression they commit, such as with Graham's death in the first scene. In that scene, Tinker turns around as Graham lies dying from an overdose, refusing to look at the death he is just caused because to Tinker, this was entirely Graham's decision. Tinker often uses this doctor-esque persona to shed any personal involvement within the act he commits. The woman, who dances for Tinker's sexual gratification, has her freedom entirely dependent on Tinker. He is loveless. The remainder of the cast share this same relationship to Tinker, in that most of the pain and grief they go through is from Tinker's own grief and disapproval of those with mental illness or sexual minorities, or to be used as an object of pleasure. Tinker develops near the end of the play, however, where he finally uses himself to give Grace what they really wanted, which is the first selfless act Tinker commits, 90% of the way through the play. Kane makes this statement in reply to those who critique her work because they don't know what else to say. <laughs> I honestly think that's true. If, if they don't know what to say about the work, um, they go for the writer or the director or the actors. Um, and I think what happened with Blasted, um, it's quite hard to talk about the press response to my other plays because it's inevitably so clouded by what happened with Blasted and everyone is constantly re-reviewing Blasted. I think Michael Billington must review Blasted more than any other play he's ever seen. I'm permanently reading about Blasted even now. Um, and that's the part that sticks out. When the reviewers can only retell the events of the story, it becomes clear that the brutality upsets them in a way that they themselves cannot understand. I enjoy works that challenge me on what my sense of the world is and should be. And Kane's works are a fantastic vehicle to allow for this type of introspection to happen. So when it comes to approaching a piece of film or television that unearths a similar reaction, maybe ask why it is that you avert your eyes from sex, horror, or the cruelty of a human. Strip away this sense of intellectual conceitedness to dig out the thoughts you may not have realised you harboured about the world. Just a really quick end screen to just say if you like the video, subscribe, comment, like, all of the nice things like that. Uh, I just wanted to do this video because I wanted to test the waters to see if or how people 
react to a, a video basically just about theatre because obviously that permeates a lot of the videos that I go behind and it's where a lot of my thought process come from. Uh, so hopefully you enjoyed that and if you did please 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 let me know because that will definitely help me when it comes to the direction of my future videos. See y'all later!